Alright, uh, alright guys, shall we start? Yes. Great, okay, so hi, hello once again. So today we have an uh, awesome speaker, uh, two awesome speakers in fact. So uh, I hope you learn some stuff from them. Uh, first up we have uh, Johan, I think he will introduce himself. <laughs> Should I do that? Yeah, you introduce can. myself. <laughs> I have a new toy by the way. Um, well, I, I, 10 years ago, almost, I created something called Joomla, which some of you might use and then stopped using it, hopefully, and then went to something better. I, who did actually did that? I met a few people this week that were going, yeah, you know, 10 years ago I started with Joomla, today I'm not using it anymore. <laughs> and then they, they look at me like, should, and then you go like, should I say that? And then you go like, yeah, yeah, sure, you can say that. All right. <laughs> you know, because I'm doing the same. I've also evolved a little bit. Um, that's a good question. Uh, there was. Uh, it was a thing called Mambo. Yeah. Mambo. 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 Yeah. Mambo. yeah, I think. Well, I started with Mambo. And yeah. Then I went to you all. Yeah. Well, Mambo went crazy. Well, old Joomla went crazy too. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It seems to be incorporated in the product. Yeah, it's a crazy thing, right? And then we choose all these crazy names. Who calls it CMS now? Mambo. And then who calls it Joomla? Actually, there's a funny story about that. Uh, when we were choosing the name, because one of the big problems uh, forking. Uh, Forking. We actually called it sporking because it was not a fork. A fork is when you have two groups of people and one group goes like, hey, you know, we're going to go to the bay and the other group goes like, we're going to go to the forest. Um, but in our case, we actually all went in one direction. It was only the company behind it that, that stayed. The problem was that they owned the trademark on the name, Mambo. So we couldn't take the name. And then we had to choose another name, which was the most interesting and tiring experience of my whole life. You need to imagine that we forked 17 August and we announced the name on 1 September and the days and hours between the 17th of August and the 1st of September, we were almost 24 hours choosing names. We had this like list of names and then you had people in the States that were like, they were working and they're coming up with ideas and they were emailing on the mailing list uh, and on IRC because you know in those times we still used IRC actually. Um, and, and then Europe w uh, w woke up and Europe was like, yeah, those are crappy names, you know, let's do other names. So Europe came up with other names and then a little bit later, Australia woke up and they were like, what? No, more names. So we ended up with this gigantic list of names, which we brought back to three. And uh, on the list was Joomla with a U, but there was also another name on it called Zagris. Zagris. It's a funny story, by the way, because we, we did, um, uh, the marketeers do that, right? They, they then take the names and they put them in front of an audience and they ask, you know, if you, if you read this name, what do you think about it? And Juma, they actually found quite interesting. But when they heard Zagris, they were actually thinking about a sinking Russian submarine. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine that we didn't chose that name. Otherwise, I would probably not be here today. Okay, cool. Um, if you want to hear more war stories, I can probably go on for a few more hours, but I only have for 45 minutes. So. Um, I would like to I don't. I don't brought any slides, by the way. This is also an experiment. Um, I was asking if you had a whiteboard, and these days everything is digital, so I brought a digital whiteboard. Because I like to draw stuff instead of come up with slides. So this is my, a little bit of an experiment. Watch. It's actually quite cool. You can fit and then and apply, and then look. There you go. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is PHP, of course, because it's PHP user group. But I wanted to talk a little bit about an abstract concept, which is architecture and web application architecture. Now, before we do that, which PHP, whatever stuff are you using? Tools, libraries, frameworks? Like, name one. What do you use? What is your, what is your preferred thing in PHP? It needs to be written in PHP. Exactly. Good answer, good answer. Is that actually written in PHP or is it that? No, it's not in PHP. Something else. PHP Q written by Michael. But okay, good. Which is a library, right? Yeah, it's a library. S debug. Okay. Ye framework? Right? Framework uh, is more a library. And yours is a library? Uh, I don't know. You don't know? Okay. Uh, Ye framework? Same? Yeah, Yee yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, seems to be popular here. Uh, in the back, 
our friends in the back? Symphony? 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 Who? <laughs> <laughs> He's talking to me. <laughs> this, is, this interactive stuff is dangerous. <laughs> I just want to be in the back and not need to say anything at all. I'm a geek. I'm socially in, in, inadaptable. Um, so let's say that you will. Yeah, anyway. Um, PHP to PHP composer. Composer? Sure. WordPress. WordPress. Okay, that's more an application. Um, our little friend over here, big friend. Uh, cake, 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 cake. Yeah. WordPress. E. E. Wrestler. Wrestler is a framework. Wrestler. Oh, wrestler framework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's interesting. You mentioned that. I'm a Python guy. A Python guy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is the wrong room. You know? uh, yeah. <laughs> Where? <laughs> Where's the other? MongoDB. MongoDB. Yeah. <laughs> the, the driver. Um, now. Uh, <laughs> Is there anything in PHP you use when Python is not sufficient? Not anymore. Not no, anymore. Before, I think about 10 years ago, that's the last time I used PHP. You're hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably a dying race, though. Uh, <laughs> no? I used to do Numa. See? Let's add that to the list. I used to do Numa. Let's add that to the list. And actually, I did use it also uh, in the early old days for. Uh, <coughs> Uh, CLI stuff. Cool. Starting and stopping processes and all that stuff. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Our friends over here at the middle table. Yeah. No, you or me? Yeah, you. Me? Coding Niner? Coding Niner? This morning I just received a call from my client. They called me and asked, how to use Tumba? <laughs> uh, yeah. I have people asking me at the same time, I was going, no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was today with uh, uh, Drupal. Drupal? Zen? Uh, okay. That's quite funny, actually. Uh, yeah. Now, what? Wikimedia. Wikimedia. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a good one, too. We have, it's actually interesting, right? If, if you, the thing you mentioned, if you should, if you need to categorize that, is it a library? Is it a framework? Or is it an application? Think about that, right? What is it? What are the differences? Like Symphony? What is that? It's both a framework and a set of libraries. Yeah, agree. And Zend. <coughs> framework. Yeah. You can use it as a library as well. Yeah. We had a few very specific things. The the MongoDB driver, what, what, what would that be? Driver, yeah. Uh, well, it's an application. Well, we call it a library. Yeah. Right? And then we have WordPress and Joomla and Drupal. Those are? So, let's try to be interactive here, right? So if we would draw those, oops. We're gonna get something like this, and then what goes where? This is the the food pyramid. There, PHP stuff. Applications. <laughs> then applications on top. I'm starting to like this stuff. <laughs> There, I can move it around. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, application on top, and then where does framework go? Somewhere in the middle. At the bottom. Middle. Who agrees with the middle? Middle. Yeah. And all the rest doesn't have an opinion. Ah, oh, that's good. <laughs> um. So let's draw a little. Like, Line here, like that. It's a little broken line. That's yeah, fine. So, framework. And then the lowest one will be library, right? Cool. Okay. 
if there's one thing, why you use these things? Right? Why do you use, what was the Drupal guy? Where was the Drupal guy? Why would you use Drupal? Why? Yeah, why? Okay. Why, 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 why are the Symphony dudes? Where, where are Symphony dudes? Why would you use Symphony? Time to, time to market. Time to market. Uh, where are the, the Z guys? Why would you use Z? To save time. To save time. The MongoDB driver. Why would you use the MongoDB driver? Yeah, because it connects with MongoDB, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, there we go. So I'm trying to get somewhere because it defines a feature. Right? A specific feature, specific functionality. Um, if you ask a lot of people why they choose a framework, let's say Zen, Symphony, Z, they will mention like a cost benefit or not economic benefit, but they will also mostly mention features because it does this for me. It does this well. It, it's feature functionality driven. Uh, if if you go here and you go to applications like Drupal and WordPress and Joomla, then people always go like, yeah, you know, um, because it, it, it has this specific feature or it's, it's easy to use, which in a way is also a feature. Um, and then they start comparing the systems based on feature lists, right? That's how we do stuff. Um, well, they might uh, wait. <laughs> but you're the Python guy. Uh, that's still my PHP That's true. We have evolved in that direction. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if, who, develop, who, who develops applications from scratch? Like you use a framework like Xanth or Xe and then you deliver a project for a client. Use a framework for client. Yeah, to deliver, to solve a problem for a client. Right, who does that? Okay, a couple of us. Um, and then we will probably choose one of those frameworks, right? We might combine it with some libraries, and we will deliver a certain application. That solves a certain problem. Agreed? Now, the next client that comes in, we do the same thing. Right? You get this whole uh, this whole pyramid again, right? And you probably will use the same framework, maybe a different version. You will build an application, and the result is going to be very similar code-wise, that it's going to be so much different that the two cannot really work together. You get what I mean? And then you go to the next client and do it again. Now, that's a problem, right? Because we developers are inherently lazy, and we like to reuse stuff. We only like to build it once. Yeah? We don't like to repeat ourselves. We like to build it once. And then we want to reuse what was already built. And there's a lot of reusability here, right? There's a lot of libraries in the PHP landscape. With Composer today, which we didn't have a couple of years ago, there's now so much stuff that you can reuse. Still, in this pyramid, there is something missing. There is a layer here that is missing. See, this is my question again. Why do you use Yi? Save time, but why does it help you to save time? How does it help you to save time? Say you can apply a lot of extensions, modules. Okay, but I, I can save time with Zen and Symphony, and I can write modules and extensions for Zen and Symphony too. So same deal. Uh, why e? There's difference. Which di which difference? Uh, you actually compiles the file on the time and choose the language file it does, so it save the performance. Okay. And the file can be secured. Okay. Okay, I don't know about that specifically, but okay. Uh, Zen guys, Symphony guys, why do you use Symphony? Right, like suppose you have a client, right? And the client actually knows about this stuff. And he, and he gives you a problem, he said like, you know, here, project, problem, go solve it. And you come with a solution and he actually audits your code, or lets your code be audited by somebody else. Hey, 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 hello. Um, 
And uh, then he sends you a mail and says, like, yo, we saw that you used the uh, E framework, or in your case, like Symphony framework. Um, like, why, why, why did you do that? Okay. Good. Anything else? Bias. Bias. So then the client would go like, basically means that you only know this framework. But it's a PHP framework, so why only that framework? Yeah, this hard guy is harking house questions. This is a user group meeting at 7 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Fuck, we should be drinking and having pizza and have fun here. <laughs> Damn it. Don't do that. Um, so why? Community support. Community support? It's like a local. Yeah. Okay. Number of questions you can find, resources you can find. Okay. I had a, I, I had a guy in a meeting today who said the same thing. I, I asked him why you, he was using AngularJS, different language, but still. Um, and I asked him, like, why do you use Angular? And he said, because it's popular. I said, I don't think that, that that is a good reason. It basically means that you're the cow that flocks behind all the other cows. Um, it might still be a good reason, but it's not the reason as such that's good enough. Now, there is something missing here. That's the why you would choose something. Architecture. Architecture. See, that's the thing always. I, I'll, I'll add it here. Um, I need a pen. See, there is a part that sits approximately here. Driver, it just allows you to connect with MongoDB done talking, right? You don't need to compare it with anybody, anything else besides there are two MongoDB drivers, and then you might talk about which is the fastest or has specific features of it, but that's about it. When you talk about frameworks, things get a little bit more complex, right? Because then the question becomes, but it's easy to use, or I can develop fast with it. It is very familiar, but what is familiarity? And that's a very subjective term, right? It's very familiar to me, but it might be very unfamiliar to another alien that is actually used to the code in Python. So, um, see that there's a difference there. If you go to applications, when we talk about WordPress, Joomla, and Drupal, we always compare them on a feature level. We always talk, go like, yeah, but this has an LDAP integration, and this works like that, and this has CMS functionality, and you can do versioning with this. And this thing works like that. We compare them on a functionality level. We never compare them, at least I haven't seen any discussion on that yet, on an architectural level. How are they architected? Why do they work as they work? Actually, the only times that I see that is when the discussion is about security. Yes, I can, I can agree on that. And performance sometimes. But not much. No. So, I would like to tackle that subject for the coming 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Architecture. It helps to answer the why question. It also helps you to choose different solutions based on the understanding of the architecture. Because not all of them are equal and not all of them work equally well for your specific problem you're trying to solve. Right? Because you have people that simply go like, I do everything in Drupal. And then the guy in the other room might say, I do everything in Zend. And then another guy goes, I do everything in Symfony. And probably some of the projects are best done in Symfony, but probably some are not. So what are the differences in architecture? What is the, where are the Yi guys? What is the, what is the base part of the Yi architecture? Somebody had one. Go again? Yeah. Yeah, models. Data models. Data models. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, Entities. Yeah. Yeah. Like easily change for if we want to store a DB to MySQL to Postgres or any other MongoDB support. Monitor. 
Okay. Hold that thought. That's a good thought. Zend. What is specific in the Zend framework architecture? MVC? Are we sure about that? Hold the top. MVC. Um, Drupal. Where was the Drupal guy? Well, there's only one. And he still needs to learn it, so bad question. Um, WordPress. There were a few WordPress people here. What is specific about the WordPress architecture? What defines WordPress? Okay. But that can be said for all of them. Because what, what by definition defines a framework from a library? Extensibility. Right? The, these things are not really extensible. They're, they can be integrated. They can be used. They have APIs, interfaces, and I can just call them. Right? They do stuff for me. They're not necessarily extendable. These things are. Right? They're built in a certain way, and they allow it to be extended. They have certain mechanisms through which you can extend them. This is where we're starting to talk about architecture. on that in a little bit, but that's already a good remark. So, Yi, uh, what makes Yi, what is specific about the Yi architecture? MEC. MEC? What is specific about the Zen architecture? You can choose libraries as and more as you wish, as you want. Okay. It's a general purpose framework. Symphony, what makes up the Symphony architecture? These are really things, right, you should really understand because th this makes, makes your choice. If you're going to go for a certain solution, or a certain framework, or a certain application, understanding the architecture is key to understanding its flexibility and what you can do with it and where it will fail. So WordPress architecture, what makes up the WordPress architecture? What is the key thing that makes WordPress extendable? Well, the plugin is the extension as such, but how it becomes, how does WordPress become extendable? Yeah. Oops. Hooks. Now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Same question for Drupal. How does Drupal become extendable? No? Drupal also has a mechanism of hooks. How does Joomla become extendable? Joomla has a system called events, for, which are used by plugins, and it also uses MVC, which is being used by its components. Does WordPress use MVC? No. Does Drupal use MVC? No. Okay. So in Joomla, there are two architectures. In WordPress and Joomla, you find one, which is an event-driven architecture using hooks, which is a very basic functional way of doing events. In a programming pattern sense, how do you call that? What is the programming pattern behind that? Event-driven, Event -driven, which is pops up, uh, publisher, subscriber. Uh, that is the, 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 the programming pattern being used there. That is actually used in all three systems. Joomla, Drupal, WordPress uses that. Who else uses an event-driven architecture if we go a level lower? Almost all the things. Yeah, but one more than the other. Zend is, for example, not so good in that, which is why Zend is actually more a class library than a framework. It has not much architecture. It's much more separate libraries. Symphony, Symphony. on the other hand, this is very event-driven, right? Um, another framework which hasn't been mentioned yet is the Typo3 framework called Flow3. Heard about that? Not yet? Which, yeah, then the question comes, which architecture do they use? And then, of course, you're not going to go the end, you know, know the answer, so I'll give it to you. They use an aspect-oriented programming approach. Ever heard about aspect-oriented programming? Right? That's, that's also a way of architecting. What is the goal of architectures? There's a nice word for that. Right? 
What does an architecture do? It inverts control. It allows you to extend the underlying code base. By inverting control, there are different mechanisms of inverting control. Events are a way of inverting control. You're sending an event, and then somebody else can capture that event and say, hey, I'm going to do something here. Aspect-oriented program is also a way of being extendable to aspects. I'm not going to go into theory if you don't know it, but it's one way of doing it. There are a few more architectural patterns, design patterns. MVC is one of them. But MVC doesn't bring inversion of control. It does something else. Separation of concerns. Exactly. It separates concerns, which creates a more modular code base. And so you have inversion of control through events is more cross-cutting concerns. I'm going to try to cross-cut across an architecture. But through MVC, you can separate your concerns. Understanding how certain applications implement these architectures is actually key as a developer to be able to make a decision. Which one I'm using and why I'm going to use that. And architectural design patterns, and I only have 45 minutes so I cannot really explain them all in depth because that would take me 45 minutes per pattern, but are something that isn't talked about much. Right? We might talk a little bit about design patterns and design patterns actually sit a level lower. They're implemented more in our libraries and a little bit here. It's just how we code something. But these architecture patterns, they actually sit on this whole layer. And they influence everything here and everything there. They allow to define how things connect in your application or framework. Now, what is the difference between a framework and application? Architecture wise. Application is built for a specific purpose. Framework allows to build application. Yes, of course, for a specific purpose. So, if I would do this, what goes up here? What is what increases from library to framework to application? Specific purpose. Yes, and another way of saying that? Complexity, opinion, standardization. Right? This is why a lot of developers always go like, yeah, but I'm not gonna use Drupal or Joomla because they're too opinionated. Which is another way of saying I have a big ego and I can do it here anyway. But you know, that's the developer's ego that gets in the way. Um, we can call this opinionation, right? There is more architecture here. And we consider that even in a, in a bad way, right? Because there is more architecture and we don't really understand how that all works. It's actually starting to get in our way because we don't know the why enough. So we're louder go here. And what we're seeing recently is an interesting trend, is that we're actually moving, in PHP, we're actually moving further and further away from this level. We're going lower and lower again. A nice example of that is Laravel. Because that's a framework without an architect. Right? I'm not trying to speak bad about Laravel, but it is. Uh, it makes, it takes the opinion out. By taking the opinion out, it takes default standardization out. By doing that, it becomes very easy to use. And that's true. If you want to get started with Laravel, it's very easy to do. It's very direct. You read the documentation, you get started. <coughs> and you will be able to re release and create something with it. But if your complexity goes up, right? Good old flash. Then you will get the good old spaghetti code that we had 10 years ago again. We need to be careful with that. So what is important for us as PHP developers is that we learn about architecture. And you can do architectures with Laravel too. And slowly some people are starting to do that. And then again, we will get more complexity until, until we go like, hey, Laravel is getting too, too much in our way. So we're going to go a level a lower again and we start all over. This is this continuous thing that happens. Right? Um, this is all cool. But it's not so great. 
Because as I said, each time I create an application, I'm basically starting from scratch again, and the result is always so much different that I cannot reuse the higher parts. So with Nuku, we're trying to do stuff a little bit differently. Now, and then I need to find out how I can do a new slide. Uh, well, I'll just clear all. So, what if you do this? Now, what goes where? If I throw that whole idea of library, framework, application upside down, and I start with with this, right? And on top of that, I create my framework. And on top of that, which in our case you could call libraries, they're a little bit more than libraries, so we call them components. Then you get this. Uh, the thing here is that my arrow, whoops. <coughs> also does that. The lower you go, the more standardization and opinion there is. Right? And a lot of developers will not like this because it sits in their way. Well, it doesn't really sit in their way. It's because they don't understand it yet. Again, this is why it's important that you understand architecture. Because we are in Nuku turning this thing upside down. Right? If you don't understand the architecture, you're going to freak out. You're going to run like hell. That's OK. Uh, we're not trying to convince you that what we do is better than anybody else, but we're starting with architecture first. On top of that architecture, we create framework. And on top of that, we create reusable components. Now, what is the benefit of this approach towards the other approach where the pyramid is upside down? That anything that I build for anybody is always reusable for anybody else. Because any component that I build to implement a certain functionality for a client is built on the same framework and same architecture. I can plug it out and plug it in somewhere else. Right? Think Docker, but then in PHP. Right? Uh, Component-driven architecture. This is not a new idea. Uh, this idea exists for a long time. Microsoft played with it, and they called it uh, distributed com or com objects. Uh, in, in Apple uh, and in iOS, you find the same ideas. Um, Linux, Unix, command line stuff. In 76, we came up with the pipe. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Right. Same idea. Based in the, the shell. A little, a little application you run that you, where you pipe the output from one into the other. You have input output. Components also understand input output, and they can work together. It started actually even before that in Macro. Yeah. Where exactly. actually the whole components so idea was hardware. Yeah. So the complexity you start with is higher, but where you end up with is you end up with much more usability, interoperability, and a lot more flexibility. You can get a lot more done with a lot less. Now. Which architectures are we using here? And this is where it gets really interesting. There is one already mentioned. Oops, no, that, not that one. Aha, BBC, that doesn't work. <laughs> that would be very new, let's not go there. Let me see. Well, actually, to be 100% correct, H. Havoc? No. Yeah, this solves problems. It's not Havoc. Um, so, MEC. Um, do I have a nice little. Wow, look at that. There we go. I like this app already. Um, HMVC. What does MVC do? We already talked about it. It solves what problem? 
separation of concern, right? So we're separating our concern. Each component, because on this layer, you're going to have a lot of these guys that sit here. Each of those components is implementing MVC in the exact same way. Where does the H come from? Hierarchical MVC. What does that mean? I can have multiple MVC triads active at the same time. There are only very few PHP frameworks that can actually do that. There are few, but there are few. Why? Because most applications that use MVC, they simply take the request coming from the client and then use it everywhere. But then I cannot fire off a second MVC triad, right? I need to separate my request from my environment that I'm in. That's what we do. Um, that gives you something like this. All right, because these components, they are active and they can be interactive in a way. I can combine them through that. It's one pattern, separation of concerns. Now let's add one more. We already talked about it. Which Zend does and Symphony does. Well, Zend not so much, Symphony does. Which Drupal does and Joomla does and WordPress does. No? Come on, guys. Exactly. Events. Yeah, I need them there. Right? Event-driven architecture. What is an event-driven architecture? In Hollywood terms? Come on, you guys should be uber geeks. You should know all this stuff by heart. You should go, yeah, I know that. In Hollywood terms, don't call us, we will call you. Right? <laughs> That's events. Why is that important? What does that do? Inversion of control. Right? You're inverting the control of your application by using events. There are events being fired from these components, and other components are interacting on those, making stuff happen. Events are in most PHP frameworks today, and in most PHP applications today. They're called a little bit different, like Drupal calls them hooks, and WordPress calls them hooks, and they're procedural in, in a sense, but the basic concept is the same. Right? I'm gonna call uh, out something, and then somebody will intercept this, will subscribe to it, and will react on it. Right? Okay, that adds one more, there are more of those. Every web application today, needs to implement a very specific architecture which the web is actually built on. The thing was that a couple of years ago we didn't even know that the web was built like that. Until our good friend wrote a thesis about it and he called it restitutional state transfer and which we all know under the acronym of REST. REST is not a programming pattern. It's an architecture, a web application architectural pattern. It's a paradigm, it's a way that the, that the web works. Now, out of the box, I don't know a few frameworks, actually I don't know any, that is restful out of the box. You need to add it to it. But in our case, all of these components, they have input output, and input is request, and output is a response, and the standard is HTTP. So I have an interface that I can talk to that each of those components has and that works in the same way. Additionally, all of them output JSON on the fly without extra code required. So that's a four architecture, which is very important today on the internet, right? Because we want to be able to do mobile applications, we want to be able to do microservices, we want to be able to do a lot of cool stuff with that. And then there's a fourth one. And I had a three-hour discussion with Kim on that already. Um, there is a fourth one, which you might have not heard about. There are actually more, but I'll keep it to those four. Do you know who created MVC? No. Let's do an experiment. Something in between to put your mind off stuff. 
uh, I need you because you're almost fly falling asleep. Come and stand here. <laughs> um, I'm going to borrow you two. Okay? And I'll play along. Can you come, come here? Okay. You can, you can go here. You can go like this. You can go like this in the middle. Here, here, here. You're a computer. Um, you could be a, a Lhasa or something like that, or a Xerox or whatever, you know, something old, but you have a mouse connection right there. Um, you're a user. Okay. I'm a programmer. Right. Uh, you're approximately uh, 25, year old, 25 years old. You're living in the 70s, uh, early, early 80s, you know? Um, but when the world was almost analog, mostly analog, and it was becoming digital. That is when MVC was created. Now, you're a computer and you're actually a banking machine. Okay. okay, so you have little buttons here, stuff like that. You can't go in, you can go like that. There's stuff coming out, like here, but we're not gonna go there. Um, right? And and like, you're the client, and you're you're the bank, and you go like, hey, you know, I want to get rid of all my clerks in my bank, right? Because that costs me way too much money. They're way too analog, and I need to feed them and stuff like that. That's not fun. No, no, no. And they want to be vegetarian, and then I only have meat, and no, that's not good. Um, so I want to automate the process. Right? And you're the developer, and you need to tell this machine how that works. Now you're going to describe the problem. This needs to become a banking machine, and he needs to make that happen. So explain to him what he needs to do. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine, right? Just think about that. If you go to a banking machine, you know already it works. You know, you, you can like transport it in time. You know, in the future, and you go like banking machines that should work like this. Um, so you know how a banking machine works, right? Now explain to him how the banking machine works and what he needs to do to make it work. What does it do? Withdraw money. We, yeah. Like get the simple the, the simple thing you need to move money from your savings account yeah. on your current account. And then you need to withdraw it. Those are just moving it and then withdrawing it. Explain it to him. Explain what you just said. No! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. Try to explain to the developer how he needs to put. You need to develop a program for me, right? And what does it need to do? Whatever you just said. Okay. I'm gonna try something else. Michael, you're gonna try to explain to our developer here how this uh, needs to work. It needs to move, be able to move money from this account to another account. And then this, uh, this computer needs to know that this money is there. And I need to be able to go there and say, hey, I want this money and it gives me the cash I need. And needs to deduct that amount from my account. It needs to know how to do all of this thing. Okay, you got it? So what, what did you remember from what he said? Uh, moving money from one account to another account. Moving and money? And then... One account, other account? Yeah. And then what, what else? Uh, getting the money from... Getting the, money? Yeah, from the machine. From the machine? And then deducting the De amount. Deducting the amount. Then, yeah. So moving account. from one account to another account, yeah. right? And then deducting the amount to take the money from the machine. Yeah. Right. Now, program. <laughs> uh, press the buttons. <laughs> Uh, now imagine, right? You, you're, you, imagine that PHP already existed and you need to develop it in PHP. There you go. <laughs> uh, wait, so how, how, how... What would your next step be, right? So there's a problem being defined, mm -hmm. right? This is how a client comes to you, he defines a problem. And then he, and he, he brabbles to something, right? He, it doesn't make any sense. Moving money from, a, a, from one account to another that's very cryptic and very subjective, right? One account, which account? To another account, which other account? Right? And then, right, because that is how people think, right? They think very abstract. They make a lot of assumptions. Right? This is the most, the, the, the way that we define problems, through assumptions. So, moving is an action, right? Money is the data and the account is another type of data, is an entity, right? And the machine itself, and the screen that it has with the keyboard, is one that's going to perform it, and it's also the user interface that's going to show it, right? So, 
come on, you need to think. <laughs> yeah, I went to the street and they went to a banking machine and the machine went like, I don't feel like, you feel like, you like it today? <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> not gonna happen. <laughs> that, that won't work, right? So, so you need to program it in there. And to do that, you need to take the subjective description that the client has given you and you need to make it into something that, that makes sense for the computer. Right? Now, go stand here. I'm the computer. I only know ones and zeros. Okay, so yeah, I need you to be able to access one account. Mm -hmm. Which account? The whoever is using the terminal. Okay. Uh, and who is that? The, How do you know who's going to use the terminal? Yeah, so, uh, so there has to be a way for the user to identify himself to you. How does he do that? By inserting a card. Uh, and what's on the card? Uh, the identifier for the user. Exactly. What does it happen with that identifier? Okay, yeah. So, Sequence of teaching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to give you a sequence of numbers, and then using that number, you're going to pull account information for that user. And then after you get that account information, you should be, depending on some business rules, you should be able to uh, deduct some value from this field. OK, good. You're getting there. So I'm not going to do all of it because then we have written a bank automate. Uh, so I'm not going to do that in ATM. But yeah, that's true. So there's a lot more that the computer needs to know, right? Yeah. All the information that you're now explaining is, in, is, is stuff that we will actually be starting to program. And when we're starting to program that, we're going to divide that information into specific parts. We're going to separate the concerns. And we have three concerns. We have controller, which are our actions, moving data, deducting, which is another action, and then transferring, which is transferring, and then also getting it out of the machine. Those are actions. We have model and data itself, which is the money that is being transferred, and we need to be able to, uh, to say which amount. And then we have a view, which is going to interact with the user, because the user is going to use the keyboard, and it's going to give input to the machine, and the machine is going to give feedback back through the screen. Right? Now, you can go sit down. Okay. Um, so this guy, <laughs> now you were good. <laughs> because then you don't fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> see, it's not that boring though. You can actually make it fun. Uh, can you do it on one uh, leg, please? <laughs> okay, that's it. Uh, what did happen? Um, uh, I lost my connection. That's not good. Anyway, um, so our friend that came up with MVC. You know, I'll try if I can find it back. So the guy that came up with MVC, which um, is 80 years old by now, he basically said, we need to come up with a way to tell a computer what to do. And the better the world, the virtual world of the computer resembles the physical world of the user, the better and easier we will be able to solve the problem. This is where MVC comes from. And it comes from an age where we were going from analog to digital, you know, where when Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were still puppies and doing their own little startups in their garages, which later become million dollar companies. And we are sometimes forgetting that as developers. We're forgetting that what are we actually trying to do? What is all this development thing about? What is all this programming about? Oh, well, it's about translating a, virtual, a physical world into a virtual world and making those two seamlessly as seamlessly as possible. In an ideal world, in an ideal world, what I do here and how I explain it here to the computer and how the user explains it here is exactly the same. We're a little bit far from that because one account to another account, <laughs> you know, some people actually, when I do this exercise, some people go like, yeah, you know, I go to the bank automate and I put my card in and then I just flip some money. <laughs> So we're a little bit away from being able to explain it in that sense. But that is basically what word is about. This is the cool thing with technology. Sometimes it loses connection. Um, so there is one problem with MVC. There is one, one, one problem with it. Yeah, yeah, I'm not connected, right? Anyway. Um, I'll do it without. Uh, there is one problem with MVC. It separates concerns. And who has already done MVC implementations? Some of you? Who, who uses MVC as a pattern? 
as long as you use a framework, is you are using MVC as a pattern, right? Yeah, but not all the frameworks have MVC, but yes. There's one problem with MVC. When you separate concern, that's fine. But where does the transfer go? Like, where does the algorithm go that defines how the transfer of the money happens? You write it yourself. You write it yourself. But then where in the MVC does it go? Model. Model? Why in the model? Business logic. Business logic? Yeah. Should go in the model? Yeah. And then you get fat models. Something like because then your model becomes very coupled to the specific problem and then you cannot reuse it in another way. So that's not ideal. So where do you put it? Controller. Why in the controller? Why not? Why not? Well, that's a good answer. I mean, <laughs> well, like, let's agree that we can definitely not put it in the view, right? That would be a mess. <laughs> that would be a bad idea. So in the controller. Why in the controller? Yeah, but, but in this case, I'm transferring money from my savings account to my current account. What if I want to transfer money between two savings accounts? And I have put this hard-coded algorithm in my controller that transfers from savings to current. Yeah. See, then I get a coupled controller. Yeah. It's not good either, right? The controller can do the transferring, but then again, you know, it shouldn't be coupled to the source and the destination. So that's not a good solution either. Plus, if you put it all there, you get fat controllers. Uh, Service layer, yeah, that has been the modern answer, right? If it doesn't fit in any of those three, well, we do a service layer. It's actually the modern term for helpers, right? Because we all agree that helpers are a bad thing to do. Yeah, we have these helpers lying around, so let's not do, use those. Um, so we, uh, we, we do a service layer. That, that's not good either. So where, where do we do it then? That's the problem. So the guy that came up with MVC, he said, you know, we never really be able to solve that. We have separated concern, but we have never been able to actually implement, find a place where behavior, algorithm, interaction goes. Right? It doesn't really fit in those three. And we have been coming up with, we have been discussing where to put it, and we came up with different ideas and ways of doing it, but we never really solved it. And he came up with something new in 2008 which is slowly finding its way in the web developer community, and it's called DCI. It stands for Data Context Interaction. And it's, the idea is that it solves the behavior problem. Where does the behavior, the algorithm go that defines how this transaction happens? It goes into DCI. Uh, don't have enough time to explain how DCI completely works, but it stands for data context and interaction. The data, the money. The context is an, is an object that defines how multiple objects will work together, the source account and the destination account. And the interaction is the algorithm itself that defines how that transfer happens. Right? There's one problem. DCI doesn't describe how it can be augmented on top of MVC. They're not there yet. There are different people experimenting with that, but there's nobody that really says, no, this is the way it should be done. And that's what we're trying to do with Nuku. How can we put the DCI implementation on top of an MVC implementation? Right? So we have something called behaviors, where the business logic goes. What does that give you? And it's unfortunate that I've lost my screen, but what does that give us? a very clear separation between two very important things. Because your MVC is a separation of concern and it defines a certain form. And the behaviors are implementing algorithms, they define a certain functionality. See, until now, we have always been focused on form, in a way, with MVC. Actually, most frameworks today are actually only uh, focused on functionality, because they only implement event-driven architectures. They only invert control to like, figure out where, through those events, you can put functionality into, into them. Like, when we evaluate 
we always evaluate on based on functionality. What can it do? Not how does it do that? So MVC is a way of defining a form that is very strict and very rigid. That sits on a lower level. That form can be reused and reused and reused again. And on top of that form, you're going to define functionality through behaviors. And those behaviors can be switched out much more quicker. Right? If I need the thing to work a little bit different, I'll just put another behavior in and I flip one out. Uh, the functionality is something that defines business rules and business rules change. And in an agile world, our client comes up with different ideas every day before we even have to go to the solution. So we need to be able to evolve quick. Uh, but the underlying form, the underlying MVC form stays. And that's probably a next step that we're gonna see at least what we're trying to do. Right? How many minutes do I still have? Not much, I think. Okay, I'll quickly show five lines of code, how that works. And then I'm done. Uh, and I need a laptop back. Mm. Work on my screen. That's not good. Uh, you need Wi-Fi? No. Well, I'm. Okay, so. so the framework today can run. So the framework today can run in Joomla because we're starting from a Joomla base, but it's completely decoupled from Joomla. You can also run it standalone. Uh, we actually trying to make it work in WordPress. We did a proof of concept with that too. Uh, maybe eventually on Drupal. Um, basically, because the form is the same, it can be used in different inside of different other applications or on its own. Um, what you see here is actually quite simple, right? This is a list of to-do items with uh, a to-do item, uh, simple user interface, and you could develop that in any way. Um, what is cool about it? and this is one of the architectures, is that it outputs JSON on the fly without writing any extra code. This is architecture number one. Um, so how does it look like? And I'll quickly show you a little bit of PHP code to give you an idea. There is not much code in here, that's the thing. So this is the framework. The behaviors I, I talked about, controllers, you find every piece of MVC in your controller model uh, view. To generate an HMVC, we have a dispatcher that sits before your controller that actually abstracts the request. So that's the one pattern I talked about. The behaviors are Things that you mix in into our objects uh, would take us too far to explain it, but we're basically extending the functionality of an object at runtime, not through extending a clause, but to injecting it at runtime. Um, and then the templates, which is your view layer and your database connection. And there is a complete entity framework in here so that you can extend this with any data. Like if you want to do Mongo, you just plug in Mongo and you're done. Um, because this so because this thing that I cannot show you that I should actually build a component up and then I can show you a bit because it is based on a very specific form and a very specific architecture building something on top of it is a matter of specialization the way you do that is defined, which is the architecture that defines it, that you need to understand, otherwise you get nowhere, and then it just becomes a matter of specialization, specializing what is already there. And in a lot of cases, it is simply a matter of adding behaviors to do things. So your dispatcher that sets this all in, uh, in, in function is actually nothing, because I could even remove this. Um, and then, where I go? Then you have, this is all there is to dealing with, a, with, with an activity controller or with a controller. There's a little bit of stuff happening here, but not, but that, but not much. 
actually there is no item controller for, uh, for you to do items at all because this is just done by the framework. Right? In most cases, you don't need to extend the controller at all. You don't need to spe uh, specialize the controller. It's all done. Um, and on most frameworks, you need to start thinking about, okay, controller actions, what do I call them? Um, how do they work? How are they implemented? Because most MVC frameworks don't do that. In our case, there are only five. Browse, read, edit, add, and delete, which is the same as CRUD, in a way. And, and everything works like that, you know? Yeah. With the, the internet works like that. The internet is get, put, post, delete. Why would we need to come up with all these different kind of controller actions? We have solved that problem already. Um, Model-wise, this is an items model. Uh, you could do a lot of stuff with this. We're not implementing a whole doctrine, complex stuff. We're just having a model. The model has some state, in this case, an enabled uh, state that you can use in your URL. And then you're going to define some querying here. Very easy to move in and out. If you wanted to implement the whole doctrine here, you could. But there's not really a need to do that. Um, views, these are the things that you need to write your, on your own because you still need to write your HTML actually to generate your views. We're not creating stuff here like what Rails does, right? Rails is auto-generating code. Um, I don't like that principle because the moment you start auto-generating code and there's a bug in the auto-generator, <laughs> you should actually not need to write the code. One thing you always need to write is, of course, your, your, your view layer and your views. This is just to show the form. Um, and this is the list of items that you see here. Um, what else can I say about this? Not that much. Um, I'll show you one type of behavior. Uh, and to complete my story. So I started by saying we have MVC to separate. This is MVC to separate. Out of the box, this generates JSON. So it's a complete REST implementation. Your controller is RESTful and is HTTP aware. You don't need to worry about that anymore. Uh, error codes and, and status codes, that's all HTTP. Um, how, how do the behaviors come in? That's quite complex. It took me three hours to explain uh, a few days ago. But I'll show you the example. Um, so this is a list of activities. What I want to do here is if I add an item, delete an item, change an item, edit an item, I want to generate a log about that. I want to be able to log it. And I want to be able to log it for anything and everything that I plug this behavior into. Because this framework has a very fixed form, I can do that. I can make a lot of assumptions. Now, watch. I go here, and we will just. You see? It just records that this item was edited. Um, I could do this. And then he knows that it was deleted. Now, the amount of code required. Can you zoom in a little more? Yeah, sure. I'll zoom in a bit more. Uh, this is hard to work in. If the, the, the do item in the administrator, because it separates applications, this one needs to behave as loggable. And you're injecting the com activities controller loggable behavior in there. This is abstract, right? Because I need to explain the whole architecture. But basically, what happens here is now this controller becomes loggable. It becomes, it doesn't really understand that it's loggable. It's actually this behavior 
that on all the things that happen here, this behavior is getting called through events. Uh, we're just finding a bunch of events. And this loggable behavior will start logging all the actions that happen here. And because the form of this architecture is so rigid, I can do that. I can make a lot of assumptions. Because I only have browse, read, edit, add, and delete. So I know what is happening in there. I know when it's happening and how it's happening. I know what data comes in and out because we have an entity framework that defines how these data entities work. So I can make all this stuff work together. And the code for that is going on two screens. Um, uh, move out a bit so I can work here. Heh. <laughs> Where are you? I'm gonna where are my preferences. Um No, I'm done. Okay. I just want to show you where the component is that does this. Okay. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. We're now installing them through vendor, which I forgot. Um, so this is this component. This is a component that can interact with another component through a behavior. So two components that actually don't know about each other that are being interfaced through a behavior. When an added action, a delete action, or a, an add action happens on one component, I'm adding an item. This activities component, because it's linked with it, will understand that and will go, like, oh, I need to log that. The beauty of it is that Whatever other component I create, let's suppose I create something to manage files, to upload files, you can just hook this in. Right? So to go back to my story, because you create a very rigid architecture, and you implement different architectural patterns on top of that, you can create a lot of flexibility and reusability, which you don't get with frameworks that you have today. Because in the, today's world, you always need to do it again and again and again. Because there's too much, not enough, default and standardization and not enough architectural patterns being used. This is why, but that's another uh, story, this is why in the JavaScript world, my preference is Ember.js and not AngularJS. AngularJS is the most popular, but the least architected. Ember.js is the, mo the more architected, the more flexible and the more powerful solution because it's driven by standards and defaults. So, what I wanted to teach you today or make you aware of is that if you choose PHP or any frameworks or any solutions, don't always go for the quickest, the fastest, the most documented, the, the largest community, the most popular, but also look into them to understand which architecture patterns that they're using and how that actually might help you in the future. In Angular's case, Angular just announced their 2.0 version and they basically said, we're going to remove everything and start from scratch. <laughs> this is because they don't have any architecture in place and they cannot make any assumptions. People are just doing whatever with it they please. Amber, on the other hand, has made a similar announcement and it's really funny to see. They made a similar announcement and they said, well, we're going to go to 2.0 but we're going to be 100% backwards compatible. Why can we do that? Because we can make a lot of assumptions on how people are using our code. Because it's very rigid, and it's very standardized, and it's very architect. Right. So if you go with the popular Angular, and you need to move from Angular 1.0 to 2.0, you're going to need to redo a lot of stuff. You need to, need to relearn a lot of stuff. If you go with the less popular but better architect than Ember, you will be able to move seem more seamlessly to their 2.0 version. Which, in a business case, is also important. Right? So that is basically my little story. Maybe for the next time I can explain you the whole framework, but that would take us a couple of hours.